Grab your Bibles, turn to Job chapter 1. Don't worry, I'm not singing the special, okay? So we're going to forego the special. Job chapter 1, if you'll join me there and grab your Bibles. If you need a copy of the Scriptures, there'll be one there in front of you, in the back of the pew. We'd love for you to join us as we continue and, uh, uh, in our study as we're looking here in the book of Job, endeavoring to know our God and uh, such. And so we'll get the slideshow here in just a moment. There we go. All right. Appreciate you being here today. I can tell um, you're, you're weary, <laughs> as I am, and uh, many of you I can just simply sense a little bit of, uh, boy, it's been a long week for you, and a lot going on, and maybe a lot going on this week, and uh, uh, just thankful that you and I can have this respite, this little break where we can come away and be with our Lord today. And so trust this morning you and I will be able to do that and kind of focus our attention and and our energies on what God has for us. It's been a delight already to look at this book of Job. And we've seen Job's response initially, and it was what I would call doctrinally sound response, Job's was. Uh, here he, uh, he trusted in his God, his sovereign God, and that faith did not waver early on. And uh, yet as those things tarried, the troubles and trials, and, and uh, you and I have troubles and trials today, no doubt, but as they tarried, he was exposed to what I would call the multifaceted fault of the- human thinking that we're all tempted to give into at times. In the face of troubles, trials, you name it, and maybe just suffering, maybe weariness, whatever the case may be. It came from his wife, and then it came from his f- three friends. You remember the three friends, and they, they simply had the, the idea, the thought, the severity of Job's suffering must be a sin of some, uh, a sign of some grievous sin in his life. That uh, They have essentially said to Job, you're suffering greatly. Therefore, you have sinned. And we evaluated that biblically. We also learned from Christ's interaction with disciples this simple truth. God allows and he sends some trials so that grace can explode upon the scene. God's glory can be revealed. And that through them, God hands out that abundant grace, glory for his his glory is witnessed and manifested in the miraculous and wonderful ways and workings of God on display. And Job's friends and their advice was very much faulty thinking. Job did well in refuting it, we saw that, and he answered them doctrinally well, but it wore him down. And that's what trials and trouble and suffering often do. They wear us down physically, and then often they'll wear us down spiritually. And as he argued with them, he defended himself against those accusations. He opened himself to other faulty thinking. I mean, last week, you remember what we saw? He, he, he began to think about God and that God was hiding from him, that he was treating Job like an enemy, not like a loved one or a friend. And we said it pictures well here, this faulty thinking. Trials and troubles, when they drag on with little resolution or relief, can cause us to think that God has departed or is distant. He's distant from us. He, he, he's, he's not in my life. He's not active. I, he's just departed. He's distant from me. We saw those verses where Job expressed that, that God was hiding from him, that he couldn't find him. He's looking forward and backward. He, he could not find God in this situation. That's what Job felt like. And you know, it reminds us that such thinking stands in opposition to what we know about the very character of God and the doctrine of who God is. So here's a pertinent question. When you and I are facing tr- suffering and trials and trouble, we ought to ask ourselves simply this, is what I'm thinking or even maybe what I am feeling? Because feeling often, our feelings often impact us. Is what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling in agreement with or in opposition to what I know about my God? To the knowledge that I have of my God, his character, the doctrine of God, is what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking in the midst of the trial, trouble, suffering, is it in agreement or is it in opposition to what I know about my God? And that will help us to uh, identify some faulty thinking in our lives and say, you know what, I don't want to entertain that. Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true and honest and just and pure? If that's not it, I don't want to think on it. I don't have anything to do with it. See, uh, Job found himself there. We, we talked about the incongruency of what Job was thinking with what we know about the character of God. We saw there from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, God never leaves us alone. He never forsakes us. 
And that's his promise. We also saw that God is, and I love this statement, is only a drawing near away from any of us. He says, draw nigh to, to me and I'll draw nigh unto you in James chapter 4 and verse 8. Those are some of the moorings we said of, of the Christian life, the anchors, and we don't want to wander away from those. As trials and troubles come and they become overwhelming and they affect our emotions, they affect us physically, we don't want to get away from the anchors, the moorings of the doctrine of God, what we know about the very character of God. Then there was one other area that we saw last week, and that's something that you and I can empathize with, right? The ups and downs struggle of trials, troubles, and difficulties and sufferings. No matter where they come from, what kind they are, what variety, there's the up and down. We saw that Job had good days, but he also had bad days. One moment he was questioning all he knows about God, and the next he's rehearsing the very promises of God. We saw that there in Job 23 and other places. We said that Job needed to be reminded of a couple truths. What were they? Number one, I, I can not only trust him in um, uh, the end, but I can trust him in the moment. Uh, I can, not just to bring it all to good, but I can trust him right now in the moment of the, the trial, the trouble, the, the suffering. Secondly, he's not only the God of heaven and eternity, he's the God of earth and of today. He is the greatest support that we could ever hope for in this race, as we saw last week, that's called the Christian life. He isn't just there at the finish line. He is with us every step of the way, giving us exactly what we need. And that's what, what Job forgot. And it affected, certainly, his thinking, his outlook on life. And it, it, this is one of the things, if you read it as, you, you remember, I mentioned it a couple sermons ago. He, one of his statements was, what, cursed be the day I was born, essentially. The day of my birth, I can't, cursed be that day. And he, he was lamenting of life. What led him to that was this faulty thinking and the multifaceted human faulty thinking that he gave into. And sometimes you and I forget that God is with us every step of the way. We are tempted and Satan would love to, us to think that he is distant. He has departed from us. Now we turn our attention back to Job chapter 1, and we're going to read verse number 1 in just a second. But would you pause with me? Let's take a, a moment and have a word of prayer and ask God to bless in this, his service. Our Father, in this moment, we quiet our hearts before you, and Lord, we would ask that you would help us to focus our attention on you now. Lord, as you have taught us much in this passage, in this book, we pray, Father, that you would help us to learn today what you have for us. Now, Father, I pray even in this moment that we be honest with you about the things that trouble us, about the suffering that we are experiencing, and Father, even maybe some trials we are going through, Lord, I, I would pray, Lord, that in the midst of these things that we would learn the great truths of your word that you would have us to glean. My Father, this morning I would pray that you would speak to every heart. May every person gathered here right now, in this auditorium, those listening by live stream, would they sense your presence? May you be real to them today. And my Father, I pray not just today, but every day they face troubles and trials and suffering. Lord, I pray that you would speak much to us today. And Lord, help us to hear. Help us to take it to heart and, Lord, to learn much from it. And my Father, we will certainly give you the glory for all that you do. Now, bless in this service, I pray you'd fill both myself and these who are listening with your spirit. Would you help us remove every distraction? Lord, would you help us to now in these moments just glean your word for the powerful word that it is. May we learn from it. We thank you this morning for being such a great, loving, living God. We worship you this morning. Now help us to grow in the ways that you would desire. We love you. It's in Christ's truly precious name we pray. Amen. Job chapter 1, verse 1. Turn your attention back there with me, if you will. And uh, we read this some time ago. There's a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. Notice what it says. And that man was uh, perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Okay, so what we are finding here is exactly what his defense was to his friends is true. It gives credence to what he said. They came along, they said, listen, Job, we think you got some sin in your life. There's some great heinous sin. You have done something to warrant the judgment of God. And, and Job has argued now for many chapters, the middle part of this book of Job, he said, that's not true, I haven't. And I love the statement that we have here. He was perfect and he was upright and he was one that feared God. He was he skewed evil. 
What does that tell us? He was a solid believer. He was a solid follower of God. He was a faithful follower. He wasn't perfect in the sense that without sin, but notice he did keep short accounts of sin with God. He, he, he didn't allow there to be sin that continued in his life. There, 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 it was an active part of his life where he confessed his sin and he said, God, I, 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 in fact, I'll, I believe in a moment we'll see that he offered a burnt sacrifices for the sins that he committed. Long before the Mosaic Law came along, long before God instituted the burnt sacrifice for sin, I believe God had revealed it to Job and Job made it a practice to say, you know what? I don't want there to be sin in my life. I don't want there to be sin in my children's life. I want to take care of it i want to keep a short account with god and when god looks down from heaven i don't want him to think that there's any unrighteousness any wickedness in my life i don't want him to see anything wasn't that he was perfect in the sense that he did not sin oh he sinned he just kept a short account of sin he did not let it stay there and so here we read he was upright with god you see, verse number five is the, the verse I alluded to. It tells us that he, he, he offered continually, I love that statement, sacrifices for the sin on behalf of his children. And so we can safely assume that he did likewise for himself. We are told that he did what? He feared God, the awe and reverence of God, the God of all creation. He recognized him for who he is. He feared him. There was awe and reverence of him. And then, you know what that last part tells us? He had come to know his God. He knew the heart of his God. It said he eschewed evil, uh, uh, old English word, and it, it simply means that he removed it, he avoided it. In other words, he couldn't stand it in his presence. You have something that you don't like in your presence? I'll tell you what I do. I don't like broccoli. Get it off the table. That's what I, I don't want it in my presence, okay? Get it away. That's just me personally. My wife likes it. Some of my kids like it. Good for them. Amen. They can have it all. Keep it on that end of the table. Get it out of my presence. That's what this word means. It's skewed evil. He had come to learn and know the very heart of God. Hey, listen. The Bible says what about our God? He is so holy that he cannot look upon sin. And so Job now has learned who his God is. What I hope is your desire today, what my desire is today, I want to know my God so intricately, so intimately, that I have his heart. Oh, that you and I could be called like David, a man, a woman after God's own heart. When we read that he eschewed evil here, it is, it's, it, well, okay, so he didn't like evil wickedness. It says so much more. It's so much deeper than that. He, his heart was knit together with God's in their view of sin. Could not stand it in his presence. It's quite the testimony. It's quite the reputation that God tells us about Job. And it gives credence to his self-defense that we read about in these middle chapters of the book. In other words, when he tells his friends this, listen guys, hey, uh, I don't have any sin. There's, there's no big sin in my life that's causing this. He's correct. You see, the Bible teaches us some things, and again, we're doctrinally learning some things through the book of Job. We're understanding some truths that, that come up and affect our faulty thinking. We see that certainly God chastens the ones that he loves, but this is not the case here. We see that, and that's established in this book. It's good to know and understand that. It isn't that God is correcting him, is chastening him because of some sin. This isn't a Jonah issue. Uh, this isn't something as such. We also have come to learn this. He also tries the faith of those he loves. He desires growth and greater dependence on him. He even uh, desires greater understanding of how he works. Do you realize that life is a classroom? You say, what is the subject matter? It's not math. It's not English. It's not physics. The subject matter of life is learn about your God. How he works. His ways, His will, what He does. Come to know your God. May I just tell you right now, I believe there's too many Christians who have missed the subject matter of life, and that's to know your God. You will spend eternity with Him. And may I just say, this is like elementary school, this is like high school, we're getting to know our God before we spend eternity with Him. And trials and troubles, suffering have a way of really bringing us the task on the subject matter at hand, learning who our God is. My friend, that is the desire of God often. You, you name it today. What have you gone through? What is the trial? What is the trouble? How are you suffering in this life? 
it very well could be that God wants you to grow in greater understanding of who he is, greater understanding of what he's doing. You see, friend, we are reminded here in the book of Job, there is always something to learn about God in every trial, or at least to renew our appreciation of about our God. Every trial. There's either something to learn. There's another lesson, okay? And uh, uh, we have children, they will sometimes lament, oh, I got another test today. I, I have another quiz today. I, uh, there's something happening at school and so forth. You realize for you and I, every trouble, every trial, every time of suffering is another opportunity for us to learn something about God or to renew our appreciation about something about our God. You see, Trials truly wasted when we come out on the other side and we don't know him better, we don't appreciate him more. Here's Job. Job's in the midst of a trial, and I will tell you, up until the middle of Job, I don't think Job is learning a lot new. In fact, we know that he's not appreciating who his God is, and so we're going to see in the chapters ahead that he comes to this point that there's a turning, there's a, 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 a watershed moment in the life of Job in the midst of this trial where he begins to have his eyes open theologically, doctrinally. He begins to know some things and learn some things or be reminded of some things, and I will tell you, it's exciting. We won't get to it all the day but when we get to the end of Job his eyes are open his appreciation of his God is as great as it has ever been that ought to be our desire when you and I walk through the troubled waters when we go through the fire we want to know him better we want to learn more about him we want to grow in our appreciation of God we get to the middle of Job and really to the latter half of Job and we come to Job chapter 31 turn with me there Job chapter 31 there's been the banter. There's been the conversations between Job and his three friends. They've kind of gone back and forth. And now we come to the end in Job chapter 31. We look at verse number 40, if you will. Job 31 and verse number 40. Notice what it says here. Let thistles grow instead of wheat and cockle instead of barley. Okay? And again, some lamenting. But notice this last statement. This is why we read this verse. The words of Job are ended. The words of Job are ended. Okay, so he's kind of done. It's, uh, he, he's done, and, and in fact, we'll see here in a moment, the friends are done too, okay? And uh, he's done talking. He's finished answering his friends. They've gone back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. He's had the last word. And in fact, as we read this, his friends are done too. And in fact, we would say this. It seems that he's answered them well. They don't have anything to respond or answer to him here. Maybe they've concluded that he's too stubborn and pig-headed, and he's not listening to their counsel, Okay? Then we read verse 1. Notice it. That describes it of chapter 32. Notice it with me, if you will. Verse number 1. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Okay? It's a good statement. He, he, he defended himself well, in a sense. So he's done talking. They're done talking. Now, unbeknownst to us up until this point, there's someone else around here. I don't know about you, but I've often pictured that Job and his three friends were maybe sitting around a fire or something like that, or, or they're just sitting around the tent, whatever the make case may be, and, and uh, this is where all of this has taken place, maybe over several days. We really don't know the time frame. But unbeknownst to us to this point, there's someone else here. Uh, there's a young man. He's much younger than the three friends, probably younger than Job, too, is what we're guessing. And he's been, he's been listening to everything that's been said. He's just been soaking it in. He's been kind of a sponge. And, and as he did so, he's kind of ran it through the filter of what he knows about God. The doctrine that he has, that's an important character trait for any of us to have, to take what we hear, to run it through the filter of what we know of God. His word, the doctrine of God. And so this young man is, in a sense, doing that. And he's kind of reasoning through it as he takes it all in. His name is Elihu. Okay, Elihu. He's kept silent out of respect for the older men. He's, he's waited now until there's a break in the conversation. No one's speaking. It's kind of quiet. And so now it's, in a sense, his time to speak. He's moved to do so. In fact, his response will cover nearly six chapters of the book. Immediately, when you begin to read the words of Elihu, he has what I would call a, a, a younger enthusiasm. <laughs> There's some passion to him. There's some zeal to him about what he's going to say and how he's going to speak. And in a sense, he cannot keep silent any longer. He's noticed some of the faulty thinking of Job, in fact, and, and also the erroneous doctrine of Job's friends. And frankly, can I just tell you this? He's angry. 
There is some righteous indignation about Elihu that comes through. Look at verse 3, if you will, the same chapter, chapter 32 and verse 3. Notice what it says. Also against his three friends, speaking of Elihu, was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, that his wrath was kindled. It says it again. Verse 6. And Elihu the son of Barakel the Buzite answered and said, I am young and ye are very old. Okay, that's probably not the nicest thing to say, but that's what he says, right? Wherefore I was afraid and durst not show you mine opinion. I said days should speak. Multitude of years should teach wisdom. <coughs> it, it, true, great. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. And I, I can't help but think of the New Testament statement where Paul tells Timothy, don't let, a, don't let anybody despise thy youth. If you're listening to the Holy Spirit, you're being led of the Holy Spirit, as this even alludes to. He gives understanding, inspiration of the Almighty at times through certainly his Holy Spirit. Notice verse 9, great men are not always wise, but that is a good human principle to live by. Okay, Somebody may have credentials, someone may have a, a, a power, someone might have popularity, but that does not make them wise. Notice it, neither do the age understand judgment. Therefore I said, hearken to me, I also will show my opinion. Behold, I waited for your words, I gave ear to your reasons, whilst ye searched out what to say. Verse 12, yea, I attended unto you, and behold, there was none of you that convinced Job, or that answered his words. You know what we say in modern vernacular? We've been going around in circles, guys. You've been going around in circles. We've not achieved anything. You haven't convinced Job. Job hasn't convinced you of his own righteousness. You haven't convinced him there's some sin present. We're kind of going around in circles here. I think verse number three is probably the, the key verse. Notice what it says. His, his wrath was kindled. Why? Because notice the statement. This is an uh, insightful statement given to us in the book. Because they had found no answer. But yet, they had condemned Job. See, the statement here, as we read it, they, they literally found no reason, <laughs> they found no answer, no heinous sin, no great wickedness that caused these things to happen, but yet, they're still condemning him. They still condemned him anyway, saying there must be sin present, and, and literally saying, well, we don't know what it is, Job, and you say you don't know what it is, but I'm just telling you, you've got to have sin in your life, literally condemning him without any evidence, and I'll tell you today, if you're here and others have condemned you for no reason... They falsely accused you without credence. Take heart. <laughs> You're in good company. In fact, in many, we're here all the way to chapter 31, and Job and his friends have been going back and forth for 10, 12, 15 chapters, if not more. He's pretty worn out. He's been defending himself left and right, and they keep coming back. Oh, Job, don't be so, don't, uh, don't, don't be so uh, defensive. And There's got to be sin there. God wouldn't do this unless there was sin in your life. And boy, he is just being ripped apart. And yet, what have we just read? Well, chapter 1, verse 1, said that God said that Job was a pretty good guy. He was perfect. He was upright. He feared God. He eschewed evil. And yet his fellow man still wanted to find fault with him and choose to condemn him falsely. And there's a lesson to be learned here. Don't miss it. Okay? God speaks of it in the New Testament. You and I can tire ourselves out. We can weary ourselves in defense of ourselves just as Job did here. We've heard the old adage to kick somebody while they're down, right? That's, what it, that, that's literally what the friends are doing here. They, he's gone through suffering, troubles, and trials, and they come along and say, well, obviously you're a wicked, evil person, Job. Well, show me where I am. Well, we don't know where it is. We're just assuming it's there. Kicking them while he's down. I believe Job has wearied himself. I, I believe that's opened the door to the faulty thinking that he has entertained. And so you and I are encouraged to resist such temptation. We're supposed to speak the truth, and then what? We let God go to work in our defense. We, we enjoy the peace of God as he is the one who says, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. I think of David often. David, when he was told, you're going to be the next king of Israel, he goes out and he fights for King Saul at the time. He defeats Goliath. He, he wins battles against the Philistines. He's, he, he's doing all that a servant of the king should do, and yet Saul becomes jealous, okay? And they make, and start making songs about you, you know you've arrived, right? 
They're singing of David. What? Oh, Saul's killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands, all right? And so ah, Saul gets jealous, and I, we can just safely assume that Saul looked at David and said, oh, he's coming for my throne. In fact, he says something similar to his son, and Jonathan says, listen, uh, if we want to protect the kingdom for you, Dave, David's trying to take this away, and, and he, he's falsely accusing David. David has to run for his life, we know that. And some of the Psalms that are dear that David learned this truth too. Psalm chapter 7 and verse 10 is, My defense is of God, which saveth the upright in heart. Psalm 94, 22, But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. Something Job did not allow for God to kind of be his defense. He wore himself out. Learned a long time ago. As many of you have, there will always be people like Job's three friends in the world who falsely accuse others, condemn others without credence. Our responsibility in the face of such thing is to pursue being upright. Let God take responsibility for our defense. You see, Job is worn out from the trial. He's having to defend himself and having to plead his own cause in his own mind. And I think that opened the door. I, I know it opened the door for some faulty thinking, additional faulty thinking to come in. Here's how he faltered. Notice it. Look at verse 2 of chapter 32. We skipped over it just a moment ago, but look with me at chapter 32 in verse 2. We read verse 3. We found out Elihu was mad with Job's friends. Look at verse 2. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakal, the Buzite of the kindred of Ram, against Job was his wrath kindled. Uh-oh, why was he angry with Job? Because of the faulty thinking or the faulty actions from the faulty thinking. Notice it, because he justified himself rather than God. Now here's a great statement. Don't miss it today. As I said, we started this a thought for the day, and, and certainly here it is, okay? He justified himself rather than God. In this passage, I believe uh, this insightful verse, Elihu is led of the Holy Spirit to put his finger on a failure, a faulty thinking, a reasoning, and Job's answers to his friends. This last part. He defended himself rather than defending the very character and sovereignty of God, the righteousness of God's actions and the ways of God. He literally wasted and wearied himself, justifying himself in the eyes of the friends when it would have been better time better spent continuing to justify God to those who need to know him better. Elihu has been listening. And he started to see this uh, trend from Job. Job keeps going back and saying, listen, I, I, it, it's all about his defense. It's all about, hey, I'm righteous. I haven't done wrong. I, I've tried to walk rightly and so forth. And he keeps defending himself, keeps defending himself, keeps defending himself. And his three friends are like, well, Job, there's got to be a reason for why God does this, why he took away your family and all your possessions, and he, he caused all these things to happen to you. Job, there's got to be a reason. You know what his three friends needed to hear right now? God is God. Trust him. Trust him. Defend God. I, I don't know, guys. I, I don't know why all this happened. I can just tell you I don't have any sin. But I know this. God is good. And God's in control. He ought to have been defending the very character of his God justifying him in the eyes of his friends, in the eyes of all who are watching Job, because I'll tell you right now, we know that Job was prosperous. We know that, that Job was probably well known, that uh, some other passages talk about him having an influence in the community and the younger people looking up to him. So he had influence. There are people who are watching Job go through trials and troubles and suffering, and it was a great opportunity for Job to do what? Justify the ways of God in the minds and hearts of people. But what do we find him doing? He slipped into faulty thinking. God's departed. God has left me. And i got to defend myself against these attacks. You see, in chapter 1 and 2, man, it plays out so great. Chapter 1 and 2, what is he doing? Well, we saw it. <laughs> the Lord giveth. The Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God is the giver of all. God is the possessor of all. God is the creator of all. God, it deserves to be worshipped. 
We saw the doctrine. And in that chapter 1, Job is defending. He is justifying the actions of God. Listen, God is good. God giveth. God taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Chapter 2 comes along. His wife says, Job, you've got to curse God and die. This is too much. The boils, the troubles of life, the trials. Curse him. Die. Job says, no, 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 no. Should we just receive the good of God's hand and not the bad also? What is he doing? He's defending and justifying the very character of who God is. We come now the rest of the book of Job, and slowly but surely that has eroded. And instead of speaking of who God is, the very character of God, the nature of God, the doctrine of God, what do we find in these last few chapters? Well, guys, I'm righteous. Guys, I, I haven't done anything wrong. Guys, I haven't done, wait a minute, now all we're about is justifying ourselves. And that's easy to do, humanly speaking, when trials and troubles tarry. Well, God, I've been faithful. God, I, I, I've always tried to do what was right. Why am I going through this? Why, why do I have to face this? Lord, why, is, why am I facing this? Why am I going through this? Why is this trouble still here? Why does this trial just seem endless? Lord, I've tried to always do what you said. I've tried to always obey your word. And do you understand what we have done in that moment? We've done exactly what Job has done here, and we try to justify ourselves instead of justifying the very character of God. What does it tell us? It reveals something about us and <laughs> what God is doing, and it's as simple as this. There was in Job something that needed to be refined. Chapter 1, verse 1, we know he's righteous. We know he's upright. But there's a residual thing here. There's something that's there that needs to be taken care of. You remember what he's put in, uh, in Job 23.10 or what he stated here? But he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, tested me, worked on me, I, I shall come forth as gold. You know what Job knows already about his God? He knows this, and do not miss it this morning. His love for and delight in every one of us is so great that he will never cease to refine us until we are what he desires us to be in every way. Job, righteous, upright, feared God, skewed evil. Yet, under the minute <laughs> microscope that the Holy Spirit uses, there was something that needed to be refined here. Something that could and needed to be dealt with. See, Job hits on it here. He says in Job 23.10, when he has tried me, when he has literally refined me. You see, God doesn't stop. He doesn't give up. He doesn't discard us when he finds a, a, an infirmity spiritually, a chink in our spiritual armor. Rather, he goes to work even on the smallest impurity or bit of unrighteousness. And especially as trials tarry, it begins to reveal things come to the surface in our life and our, uh, our hearts and our minds that aren't good, that, that don't need to be their faulty thinking and things that God says, okay, that's exactly the impurity I want to get out. In the last, it seems, couple decades, there have been a, a plethora uh, of shows and really even game shows that have focused on forging knives and swords and axes and things. Guys who would take a piece of metal, they, they'd mold it and make it. They'd forge literally it into a knife or a, a sword that I'm partial to uh, that can cut and slice and withstand normal use. Well, in the forging process that takes place, there are times that a blacksmith will discover what he would call an impurity in the metal. And, and though they have tried to work it out and so forth, and, and sometimes uh, it is only revealed at certain parts of the forging process, and when they find that, they know that they can't go any further, that that little impurity and often a line in the metal or, or something will reveal it, they know that if it's not taken care of, that when now that knife, that sword is used against something strong, it will not have the strength. There will be a weakness that is needed or a strength that is needed that will not be there. 
that sword will be found to be faulty. That knife will not be able to cut or, or withstand the pressures that it will face down the road. And so what do they have to do? They will often have to put it back in the fire. They will all have to heat up that metal again, trying to get out that impurity. And you and I, we may look and say, I, I just don't see anything. But to the trained blacksmith, to the one who works the forge, there's just this small little impurity. And that blacksmith knows that if we do not deal with this, Strength will be compromised. It, it will not be able to do all that it needs to do. My fi- friend, I find it quite interesting that those blacksmiths will often have to do that, sometimes multiple times. <laughs> Refine the metal. Get rid of even the slightest impurity. And that action is actually something that is pictured in scriptures as our God doing with us. In the book of Psalm, in Psalm chapter 66, verses 9 through 12, this is what it says, speaking of God, which holdeth our soul in life and suffereth not our feet to be moved. For thou, O God, proved us, hast tried us, as silver is tried, refined. Thou brought us us into the net. Thou laidest affliction upon our loins. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. But thou brought us us out into a wealthy place, a healthy place. Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9 says, And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them, and I will say it is my people, and they shall say the Lord is my God. Isaiah and his prophecies, he, he speaks of God putting his own people through, notice it, don't miss it, the furnace of affliction. Suffering and trials and troubles. You see, in the moment of sound thinking and considering the sound doctrine he knew, Job did know in 23.10, he did know the truth here. What is that? That God often allows and brings suffering, even the tearing kind, to refine our righteousness. Don't miss it this morning. You're here at church, and, and maybe all things considered, you're, you're a pretty good believer. You're a pretty good follower of Jesus Christ. There is much righteousness in your life. It, it could be said of you that you are upright, that you fear God, that you eschew uh, evil, much like Job. And we read of that. Was Job a good believer? Yes, he sure was. Was there something in him, though maybe very small, that needed to be refined? Yes, that's true of all of us. God refines our righteousness. May I ask you, is 99% pure? No, it's not. Only 100% is. And so when you and I are going through trials and troubles, our thought is too. There's a twofold thought that we often give into. Number one, while I'm going through trials and troubles, God is bad. He led me through that. He's allowing these things to happen to me, so therefore God is not all that he says he is. He's not a loving God. He's not a caring God. That is one temptation, certainly, that man gives into and falls prey to. Number two is this. Not, Not just that God is bad, but that I am bad. You ever go through trial and suffering and such, and you think, well, man, I just, I'm a terrible Christian because I wouldn't be going through this if this was not true. Now, listen, we've already said there are consequences of sin, no doubt. We ought to ask that whenever trials, troubles, suffering comes to ensure that there's not sin in my life that has caused this. But when we get beyond that, we understand that, listen, all suffering, trials, and troubles does not mean you are a bad believer. Sometimes it simply means God is refining your righteousness. Refining your righteousness. You may be 98% pure. You may be 96%. You may be 85%. You may be 99% pure, but I'll tell you, I sure am thankful we serve a God that does not want to settle for anything less than 100% pure. He says, I want to refine your righteousness. I, I want to refine what it takes. And I like how one author put it. Job's pain is not the pain of the executioner's whip, but the pain of the surgeon's scalpel. Just to remove a little small impurity. Maybe at the beginning of Job, Job himself didn't even see it. Maybe you'd ask Job's friends, like, no, Job, if you want to talk to about a perfect guy, Job's perfect, man. He is, he is the best Christian I ever met. I, the, I, I tell you, he is holy. He is this. Uh, maybe everybody thought, oh, there's nothing here. 
But oh, isn't our God amazing in his ability to spot the impurity? And through this trial and this trouble, God is finding that smallest impurity. And through these things, he's trying to remove it from Job's life. We're going to see exactly next week what happens and what that is. But today, as we close, let's be reminded, there's always a twofold goal in suffering and trials and troubles. This book has borne it out. God's glory can be made manifest and that God's children can be refined. God's glory can be made manifest and that God's children may be refined. As it was true of Job, it is true for you and I today. Our trials and our troubles and our suffering are there to refine us sometimes. God knows every heart. He knows every inch of your life and mine. So you say, uh, how ought we to respond this morning? Well, I would encourage you, let's ask God a question, would you, this morning? God, what are you trying to refine in my life through the fires of the forge of trials and troubles? Lord, Lord, most people may think I'm a great person, I'm a good person, I'm a holy person, I'm a good believer, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and you may have righteousness about you. You may be upright, you may fear God, and those are all wonderful things, but I'll tell you, every one of us can have a little things of impurity. That God says, you know what, I want to use this trial in your life to expose it, to deal with it, to refine you. Can we put it another way? May I ask you, we can ask God, God, what is the big or small impurity that is weakening me spiritually, which you want to remove from my life? God, what is it right now? Lord, I've been going through this trials and trouble. You know, life isn't uh, all it should be. There's some suffering. I'm thinking, Lord, what is it right now, today, that you would want to refine me of? That small impurity. At the very least, this morning, could I encourage you with this truth that Job has opened our eyes to? His love for and delight in you is so great that your God will never cease to refine you until you are everything he wants you to be. The children's song says it well. He's still working on me. He loves you so much. He delights in you so much that the least little impurity he wants to get out. What is it today? What is it that God would put his finger on? Today, you might be a pretty good Christian. You may be better than most, yet we know that he wants to refine your righteousness. Will you submit to him by allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal it? Will you confess it and forsake it? And will you praise the Lord in heaven that you serve a sovereign God who loves you enough to refine you?